The Hidden Forces podcast features long-form conversations broken into two parts, the second hour of which is made available to our premium subscribers, along with transcripts and notes to each conversation. For more information about how to access the episode overtimes, transcripts, and rundowns, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces. You can also sign up to our mailing list at hiddenforces.io, follow us on Twitter at Hidden Forces Pod, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest on this episode of Hidden Forces is political data scientist David Shore. David was recently described in New York Magazine as Obama's in-house Nate Silver for his work on the president's re-election campaign, where he was responsible for building and maintaining the campaign's election forecasting system, the Golden Report, which accurately predicted the outcome to within a point in every state and was the primary input to the campaign's resource allocation decisions in the 2012 election. This past summer, David gave an interview for New York Magazine's Intelligencer, where he laid out his unified theory of American politics, and it goes something like this. Over the last 40 years, social trust among voters in the United States has declined by roughly 50%. The drop on its own is concerning, but until recently, it had been largely uniform. Whether you were a Democrat or a Republican didn't matter. The decline in trust was a bipartisan phenomenon. But sometime around the 2016 election, this began to change. Exit polls found that voters who registered as low trust broke in large numbers for Donald Trump. These same individuals were less likely to have finished high school and gone on to obtain college and postgraduate degrees. They were also less likely to work in an office, live in a big city, support higher levels of immigration, etc., etc., all characteristics you've heard before. But the educational component, which correlated strongly with levels of trust, seemed to be the clear dividing line between those who voted for the president and those who supported his opponent in both 2016 and 2020. So that might make you think, okay, it's lack of education that's primarily responsible. But as we said, Education levels have been rising steadily during the same time in which social trust has been declining, so that doesn't tell us the whole story. Instead, education seems to be a sort of ride-along gene that points to a larger phenomenon, which is that Americans at a national level are increasingly self-sorting into two different classes of people with distinctly different cultures and fundamentally different sets of values, attitudes, and beliefs. Whereas policymakers, politicians, and academics used to live in a totally different world than business executives, and business executives had nothing to do with blue-collar journalists and media people, all of these professionals today, who also happen to generate the highest incomes and command the largest share of wealth in our economy, not only represent a disproportionate percentage of the country's educated citizens, but also tend to share in the same cultural markers, watch the same television programs, shop at the same supermarkets, consume the same media, and hold the same political views on issues like social justice, immigration, and trade. And in the last election, in particular, they were more likely than ever to vote for Democrats. In fact, higher levels of education correlate, according to David, with higher levels of ideological extremism. And this brings us to the second observation which is that while those with lower levels of education seem to exhibit higher levels of mistrust, including mistrust of elites and their institutions, those with higher education levels seem to be moving further and further to the left of the political center from which these same distrustful, traditionally moderate Democratic voters once found themselves. The combination of these two forces goes a long way to explaining the results of the 2016 election as well as why Democrats underperformed expectations down ballot in 2020, losing seats in the House and failing, thus far at least, to retake the Senate in a year where Donald Trump seemed to do almost everything possible 
to lose this election by turning off the moderate swing voters who helped him win it in 2016. There is so much in this conversation to absorb, which is why I strongly recommend that you also check out this week's rundown. We only got through a fraction of my questions, many of which I saved for the overtime, including a discussion about the unexpectedly high levels of turnout among African-American men and Hispanics in support of Donald Trump, and what this says about the resonance of identity politics and the credibility of popular narratives put forth by Democrats to explain Trump's victory in 2016. I also asked David about the lessons that we can take away from this election, how polling needs to change, given what we know now about the complexity of the electorate, and what all of this means for the futures of the Democratic and Republican parties. And with that, please enjoy this amazingly insightful and timely conversation with my guest, David Shore. David Shore, welcome to Hidden Forces. Pleasure to be here. It's great having you on, David. So for me and my audience who may not know you or, or not know much about you, tell me a little bit about your background. What did you do? I know you were an integral part of the Obama campaign 2012 team. What did you do for that campaign and what do you do now? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I started working in politics in the Obama campaign in 2012 when I was 20. Before that, I had a math background. And the cool thing about that campaign was it was really the first time there was a large scale analytics team that was making a bunch of you know, data driven decisions. And my role was that I built the resource allocation and forecasting engine uh, that took in all of the available polling data and then kind of did a Nate Silver figure out how close all of the states were and where to invest. So what do, what have you done since? What do you do now? Yeah, so after that, uh, there was a lot of press from the Obama stuff, uh, and we started Civis Analytics, uh, which was uh, is now a 200-person company that does a lot of political work. I was the head of political data science uh, and really spent the last eight years there. And then this summer, I decamped, and now I work for a large super PAC that you know, did uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in spend in 2020. And, you know, I, I do a lot of consulting with different groups just to, with respect to ad testing and forecasting. So for someone that doesn't come from your world, either from politics or from data science, how do you describe yourself to people? <sighs> it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, data scientist is probably the right word. But I think what's really interesting about data and politics is that it's not that politics is necessarily a math problem, that you go in and you do all of this machine learning in order to figure out you know, how to win. A lot of it is that there's a lot of coordination problems in politics where you have a bunch of different groups that you know, are running into each other or can't easily cooperate. And technology allows you to solve a lot of that. And so it's something that I do really like is politics is you know, at the root, you're like studying people and how to persuade people and why people believe what they believe. But then on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of the work you do is inherently political, that you're trying to help, you know, Planned Parenthood and Next Gen, like not spend in the same districts, or you're trying to help super PACs, like talk about issues that people care about. And so a lot of the problems are political in nature, even if, mm -hmm. you know, the day-to-day -day involves a lot of math. So you're trying to get an objective picture, but you're obviously not an objective actor would you consider yourself an activist in the party? I mean, how do you think of your role? Yeah, I, I think the biggest problem in American politics is that the, in terms of being a political practitioner, is that the kind of people who choose to work in politics, and this is 100% true for me as well as any, anyone else, is are all highly, highly politically engaged and highly ideologically motivated. And so that makes us a lot worse at our jobs, both because we lack, you know, any real connection or uh, in a lot of cases to the people who we're trying to persuade or the people we're trying to motivate. But also because we're so ideologically motivated, it can convince us into doing things that are that are dumb. And I think that a lot of the value of, you know, math and, you know, the data and the politics is just as a it's a social tool to help people step back from the brink and say, OK, maybe it isn't a good idea for us to do something that's unpopular or, you know, maybe we shouldn't put a bunch of money in this race that isn't close. But I see what you're you know, getting at. I think something that's really surprised me is that 
there's always ideology implicit in everything. But I think that working in politics, people who work in political campaigns all really want to win. And ideology will motivate, you know, will push them in a certain, you know, toward some theories of how to win and other kinds of theories. But I, I've been like a, a little bit surprised that on the face, a lot of this stuff ends up not being, you know, as ideological. In terms of how I see myself, though, like, yeah, I, I think I have ideological preferences. I think everyone who everyone does. But a lot of the day to day basis is just people trying to win elections. Hmm. It's funny. I, I heard an interview you gave where I, I think this was either an interview or probably in all the different things I read about you, where you said what performed best in your like lab within your group of team members actually tended to perform worst when actually used in terms of trying to drive out voters or whatever the terminology is. So, you know, 2018 was really the first time that we had managed to build out the infrastructure to do large scale testing of ads. And something that was pretty crazy was that 30% of the ads that we tested made people want to vote for Republicans. It's just an underrated theory of change is, you know, find that 30% and <laughs> don't show them to people. But the ads that backlash, uh, sometimes they were just, you know, poorly made ads. But a lot of the time, the thing that they were ads that got liberals really excited. Like we went back and looked at the mirrors ad in 2016. And, you know, the ad was... I think it was the most shared ad of the cycle in terms of YouTube. It was like played on television. It was shared really widely. And I think it was, you know, something like, you know, there's a little girl and she's staring at a mirror and in the mirror is Donald Trump saying all of these horrible, you know, racist and sexist things and mocking uh, disabled people. And then I think the girl cries. And, and so it was a very powerful, emotionally powerful ad. A lot of people I work with really liked it, but we went back and tested it and it made working class white voters more likely to vote for Republicans. And so, you know, we took an ad that we all really liked and really resonated with us and spent tens of millions of dollars showing it to swing voters in the Midwest and it cost us votes, which is bad. You know, I highly recommend for people to see that ad just to get a sense of what you're talking about. The one I remember was a bunch of different girls sitting in front of a mirror. And when you say that, it makes me wonder how important is context in this example, right? Because if you see that ad objectively, it's hard not to feel empathy and to feel, you know, to feel compassion for the person that's going through an emotional, being emotionally impacted by these words. Does it matter what's going on in the race at that time and how the voters are perceiving negative ads against Trump or ads against Trump in general? Yeah, I mean, this is something that's hard about advertising is that there are no fundamental truths. It's not like physics where the speed of light is the, is the same all the time, you know, give or take. What persuades people and what doesn't is somewhat context specific, though, you know, it might be more stable than people realize. I think to understand why there was a, why these kind of messages can have backlash, I think it gets to this kind of core liberal conceit. I hear it all the time, which is people saying, Democrats care too much about issues. We're just these brainy headed nerds who talk about policy and we should really focus on values. And you know, the problem with that is that actually swing voters don't share uh, liberal values to an extent to which is really underappreciated. You know, if you look at swing voters views on various aspects of systemic racism or feminism or, you know, a lot of these things, they actually just don't agree with liberals on a lot of this different stuff. But they do agree with us on issues. And historically, you know, the story of the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party was always kind of run by this kind of urban cosmopolitan elite, but they didn't campaign on that stuff. They campaigned on you know, bread and butter economic issues, and that was the whole trade. So I think when you look at what that ad was, you know, 20, uh, voters saw Trump as like a very issues centric candidate and they agreed with him on issues. I think this is something that a lot of liberals don't realize is if you look at how voters rated Trump, they rated him as more moderate than Clinton. And if you look at the voters who switched, you know, one of my favorite crosstabs is we surveyed after the 2016 election, we asked opinions on universal health care and opinions on immigration. And roughly 12% of the electorate agreed with us on health care and disagreed with us on immigration. And those voters, Obama got about 60% of them and Clinton got about 40% of them. And that is roughly the story of the 2016 election. The 2016 election really was voters picking candidates on the basis of issues on the frequ with the frequency they talked about. And you know, this 12% of voters, they were disproportionately non-college white, they disproportionately lived in the Midwest, and that switch ended up hurting us in the electoral college. But I think it was a real strategic mistake 
If you look at 2016, we ran the lowest number of issue of ads about issues in any any campaign, I think, in the last like 40 years. Mm. The Wesleyan project actually went through and coded. And I think something like normally about 60% of our ads, you know, mention issues in some way. And I think that that year it was something like 10%. And the end result of that was that people polarized on issues in a way that was that worked out very badly for us. And so yeah. Does that partly explain what happened to Bernie Sanders from 2016 to 2020, that he went from being more issues driven to being more values driven and that cost him in terms of votes? Yeah, I, I think that there is a real thematic difference you know, between the 2016 Bernie campaign and the 2020 Bernie campaign. You know, I think it even shows up in the slogans where, you know, in 2016, his slogan was something like, you know, for the people, not the billionaires. And then it switched in 2020 to solid, you know, solidarity forever. And so I think there's a, if you want to build a coalition around raising taxes on rich people and creating government services, you know, creating a more fair economic system, there are a lot of people who are on board with that. If you want to create a campaign centered on like identity politics for left-wing activists, there's obviously like a much Mm. smaller universe. But I think, you know, both Sanders and Corbyn, I think, had a really similar story of showing a lot of ideological restraint in 2016. You know, Bernie Sanders was actually very careful in his 2016 plans to avoid things that could be controversial, that could be seen as large-scale middle-class tax hikes. He was always intentionally vague about how he was going to give everyone health care. And Corbyn in 2017, you know, actually was- Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, yes. Jeremy Corbyn was praised in 2017 for having a relatively ideologically moderate program too. And then I think both of them were unexpectedly successful and then, you know, kind of moved to the left on a bunch of issues and also kind of changed how they were campaigning. And then the result, you know, was that they both ended up kind of losing a lot of the working class white support that, you know, led to their initial success. So it really does highlight the importance of ideological constraint and messaging constraint uh, discipline. So I do want to dig into a bunch of these topics more. Before we do that, why don't we actually pull back a bit and maybe tell me, summarize for me, what happened in 2020? What are the main takeaways from the election in your estimation? So, you know, I I think it's helpful to just start with numbers. The first thing, and first I'll talk about what happened and then, you know, maybe I'll talk about polling. But in 2016, we got about 51.1% of the two-party vote, and when I say we, I mean Hillary Clinton got about 51.1% of the vote, but lost because the tipping point state, you know, the state that actually decided in the Electoral College, you know, she got 49.6%. So if she had done 4% better overall, she would have won the election, but she didn't. In 2020, it seems like we're going to get something like 52% of the two-party vote. So it's something like a 0.9% shift. And, you know, unfortunately, It seems like the bias of the Electoral College is actually increased instead of decreased. But in terms of what happened, there was this roughly 0.9% swing toward Democrats. 0.6 would have been enough in 2016 to win. In terms of what it looks like on a subgroup level, turnout increased tremendously, but roughly equally on each side, which I think is something that is ideologically inconvenient for a lot of people in our party. College-educated whites swung toward Democrats, while working-class white support stayed roughly at 2016 levels. And Non-white voters swung against Democrats with single-digit declines in African-American areas and double-digit declines in Hispanic areas, and with that decline with Hispanics being pretty broad across the country. Okay, I want to dig into all of those too. Before we do that, let's talk about one more thing which has to do with polling, because one of the big stories of the 2020 election was the discrepancy between the polls and the exit polls and what we've learned since and the outcome of the election. What happened with the polls this year? So I think there's two different phenomena with polling error. You can really decompose it into two different errors. You know, the first is this state by state pattern of error, which is us, you know, really overestimating Democratic vote share in places like Wisconsin and underestimating or overestimating it less in places like Georgia. This happened in 2016. This happened in 2018, which is something I think people don't appreciate. And this also happened in 2020, that there was really a very strong correlation between how many working class white people there were in a state and how large the polling error was. This trend began in 2016, you're saying? Or it became noticeable in 2016? It really didn't exist until 2016. 2016 is when it appeared, and it appeared again in 2018. People didn't notice because 
You know, there were a bunch of races in the Midwest that were closer than people expected. Places like West Virginia Senate, where the public polls said plus 12 and the result was plus two. Places like Ohio Senate or Michigan Senate. These races were a lot closer than public polls predicted. But because we won, I think people didn't notice. But there was this exact same error pattern in 2016 as 2018. And in 2020, we saw the same thing. Like in Wisconsin, Wisconsin ended up being decided by you know something like 1%. And if you look at the public polls, they had crazy plus 15 margins by supposedly high quality pollsters in the in the week before the election. So, and there are these, you know, there are scatter plots that show this very clearly. There's a very clear relationship between polling error on a state level in 2016, 2020 and uh, and 2018. And so that's the first error. And, you know, there are, in terms of, you know, I, I could talk about why I think that is, but you know, first I'll just talk about the second thing, which is in 2016, the polls, the national polls were roughly right. The final national polling average was, I think, plus three for Clinton, and that final popular vote result was plus two. But 2020 wasn't like that. Uh, so far, it looks like the average public polling bias for the presidency was something like 2.1% in support and 4% in margin. In the Senate, the average poll was off by something like 6.4% in margin, which is crazy. Um, is that true of national polls as well as state or district polls? That's right. You know, this ended up being. It looks like the final. So the bias was is, uniform across all the different, all the different races. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting thing where you can look at this polling error as it was the same bias that happened in 2016 plus a uniform constant that everything hmm. was. You know, uh, and I, I, that's basically the structure. And so these two things have kind of two separate causes and two phenomena. This question of why is it that public polls have been particularly underestimating support in working class white areas, you know, comes down to this concept of social trust that academics study. So the way that this gets operationalized, people have read Bowling alone. You know, this is like, uh, he's done a lot of work on this question. The way this gets operationalized is uh, this question of, do you think that people can generally be trusted or do you think that people should keep to themselves? And roughly... 60%, it used to be when they started asking this question in the 70s, that something like 65% of people said that people could generally be trusted. Flash forward to 2020, and that number is something like 30%. Social trust so it's has been, been declining. cut in half. Yeah, it's been cut in half. Social trust has been declining by roughly 1% per year, really since the 70s. And that's like sociologically, it seems like it's probably a really big problem. But on top of that, from a measurement perspective, it's really bad because people who trust other people or who say they trust other people are way more likely to answer phone surveys. And there's this has been known for a while. There's a lot of academic evidence for this. What is that evidence generally? Like, why do we know that? Yeah. So there was a great paper that one of my former colleagues did back in 2014 that basically showed that low trust areas have, even when you control for you know stuff like education and income, have much lower census response rates. But the other way we know is that when we actually look and use traditional, so the GSS uh, is this government survey that I was talking about, and they get a 70% response rate because they spend something like one to $2,000 per respondent. Because the GSS does all their surveys in person. Yeah, they, I mean, they do, basically what they do is they like literally hire someone to go to someone's house multiple times and they offer them $100 and they really do a lot and they end up getting to about 70%. While most, you know, phone surveys have a response rate of closer to 1%. And, you know, when they ask the question, they see that about 30% of the population say that people can be trusted. And if you use normal phone survey techniques, you know, you call a bunch of people, you ask them whether or not people can be trusted, and then you wait by age and race and gender and education, which is what pollsters traditionally do. When you do that, it will tell you that 55% of people say that people can be trusted. And so you, what you can back out from that is that people who say that people can be trusted are something like two to three times more likely to answer the phone than people who don't. And that makes a lot, even when you control for things like age and race and education and gender. And that I think makes a lot of sense if you think concretely about what's happening. There's a lot of other, you know, measures that we've looked at that are similar. You know, we've looked at, we've done five factor personality tests on survey takers, and it seems like survey takers are considerably more agreeable than average. And so it gets to this problem of, now that response rates are so much lower than they used to be, you know, if you go back to the 1940s, Gallup would call people and 80% of people would respond. Now that number is closer to 1%. And that 1% is, 
pretty weird and uh, across a whole bunch of dimensions. You know, we discover new ways that survey takers are, are, you know, not representative every single day. And one of the big ones is just this concept of social trust. But to be clear, you know, why does this matter? But this has always been true. And why did the polls suddenly become wrong in 2016? And the answer is that social trust used to not be correlated with who you were voting for. It used to be that, you know, kind of how cranky you were toward other people didn't really affect, you know, what party you were voting for, at least once you controlled for things like, you know, age and race and education and gender. But in 2016, there was a really big change in the coalition of both the Democratic and Republican parties. You know, there was a large number of non-college educated whites who switched over and became Republicans and a bunch of college educated whites who became Democrats. And if you look at these non-college educated whites who switched, there were among non, non-college whites who said that people could be trusted actually swung toward the Democratic Party, while pe- non-college whites who said that people couldn't be trusted swung toward the Republicans. That's interesting. So the distinction wasn't so much the education levels, it was actually the trust, but it just happened to be that trust and education correlate. That's right. Uh, and you know, to be clear, I don't want to put too much on one variable. You know, there, there's a constellation of traits and factors that are correlated with each other. You know, we've looked at other ways to split this up, where you know, racial resentment was highly correlated with swing among non-college educated whites. Occupation was highly correlated. You know, working in an office versus being a truck driver or working in a factory. And no matter how you cut it, you know, white people with low racial resentment or white people who worked in offices were more likely to answer phones than people who didn't. And there is this real divide. It gets that, you know, the thing that drove this, you know, wasn't literally having a college degree. It was these various measures of class Mm. and culture. And that's the key is that when we were calling into Wisconsin, it wasn't that we weren't talking to no non-college whites. You know, the, the polling industry said after 2016, you know, it's because we didn't wait by education. We're going to wait by education. And they did. And they were still wrong because they were talking to the wrong college educated whites. You know, they were talking to, you know, secretaries and teachers assistants, and they weren't talking to truck drivers and, you know, people who work in factories or people who have been laid off because these groups have really different attitudes toward society and that manifests in how they answer polls. Okay. So I actually, I want to, ask you something about polling, just to clarify for our listeners. And then I do want to get back to this kind of intersecting categories dealing with college education and trust and class and and race. Before we do that, let's discuss a little bit what polling is for you to explain to our audience how polling works and, and why sampling is important and how that relates to the fact that the number of people that answer the phone is basically 1% of the entire population and what that does to sampling and weighting. Yeah, so you know this isn't a new a new problem. You know, right now the way that public polling generally works is that you randomly generate a bunch of phone numbers and you dial them and roughly 1% of people will pick up the phone and complete the survey. And you know that 1% is highly non-random and that's been known for a long time. There are a lot of known ways in which it's non-random. Women are more likely to answer the phone than men. Older people are more likely to answer the phone than younger people. White people are more likely to answer than non-whites. And you know this stuff adds up. You know, I think the last time I looked at this white women over the age of 65 were something like 100 times more likely to answer the phone than young Hispanic voters under the age of 30 or men under the age of 30. And so that's known. And the way that people account for that traditionally is with a technique called waiting, where they say basically at a high level, all right, well, 75% of my the people who answered this survey were women. And the census says that 50% of people are women. And so I'm going to apply a weight to weight the women down so that it matches the census. And so they do this across, you know, a very, about four or five variables for which there's a very easy corresponding feature in the census. And so they look at age and race and gender. And, you know, after 2016, they also started looking at education, but that's basically it. And, you know, the problem is that even though you can adjust for those things, now that response rates are 1%, there's really a lot of other factors that determine whether or not somebody answers a survey. And those factors have become really highly correlated with partisanship. And that's why you know we've really seen this consistent error for three cycles in a row, is that there's been this big post-Trump change in the coalition. And these omitted variables from the analysis are correlated with 
you know, partisanship now in a way that, you know, is producing this error pattern by state consistently. So I just want to summarize something. What you're saying is that because most people are polled over the phone, the polls in the last few election cycle were actually sampling the wrong people. And because the representation of the group in question was so small within the sample, it's very difficult to offset it. I think that's right. And I think the bigger problem is that people aren't adjusting for enough things. Uh, we've been using basically the same kind of polling technology really since the 1940s. And you know it's very limited. Traditional weighting techniques don't really allow you to use more than four or five you know, variables for the reasons you've talked about. That if you're only surveying a thousand people, you can't adjust for 30 things. And so, you know, the industry really has to move now to using these more advanced methods where you talk to a lot more people and use modeling and all of this other stuff. And it's really hard because it, it involves, you know, business model changes. It's not like, you know, the old story with polling firms is that you would have some political guru and like a poli sci grad student and then like a bunch of interns and it doesn't really work anymore. Uh, in order for you to, you know, get this stuff right, you now have to interview very large numbers of people, you have to hire machine learning engineers, you have to have databases, and it's just become a lot harder. So let's go back to this point you made earlier about class because it sounded like this was the larger category which is very difficult to identify and define. I did an episode with Michael Lind a number of months ago where we discussed it, and he thinks about class in terms of working class and non-working class. Tell me how you think of it, and, and how do you define this phenomenon that seems to be driving so much of partisanship and electoral outcomes in our elections today? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, you know, the important... I really believe that these shifts that happened in 2016 and that still, you know, are reflective in how the election results we see today, I think that they're cultural in nature and not materialist. And what I mean by that is I think that there's a really ideologically convenient narrative that, you know, the reason why all of these working class voters have turned against the left, not just here, but, you know, in Sweden and in Germany and in France and in the UK is, you know, because that they've been abandoned by neoliberalism or that there was or the china shock or globalization and and that's why they're you know why they've turned away and why they're doing what they're doing and i think not just in the us but you know i'll talk about the us i think if you look at the results it's really clear that these divides are really cultural in nature like if you look at the 2016 election results there were to be clear it's definitely true that you know trade with china or various you know, economic policies have resulted in large swaths of the Midwest experiencing economic decline, but it's not uniform. While there are places like, you know, Indiana, where manufacturing was, you know, decimated in the Great Recession and unemployment was very high in 2016, there are also places like Eastern Iowa, where the unemployment rate was 2% because they were, you know, primarily making soybeans and they were exporting lots of soybeans to China. And so income was high and it was broadly shared and all of those things. And there's other stories too about furniture manufacturing uh, outside of Grand Rapids and all of that. But what you could see is that the areas that did well and the areas that did poorly basically swung the same amount from Obama to Trump as determined by their education levels. Basically every part of the country where Democrats formerly did well with non-college whites swung toward Trump regardless of, you know, what the local economic situation was. And if you look on an individual level, you know, with standard demographics, the biggest predictor of swinging from Obama to Trump was education and education levels univariately explained almost 60% of the county level variance in change from 2012 to 2016. But if you adjusted for racial resentment, then suddenly the coefficient on education disappears. And so I think that I'm not going to claim, that, you know, the reason why everybody switched from Obama to Trump was, you know, racial resentment. But I think it was this cultural divide between basically people with cosmopolitan values who are disproportionately college educated and people who don't don't have those values and there's a spectrum between them but i think that cultural that cultural difference is what's driving this and there's a lot of different ways you can measure that but whenever we look at stuff like occupational status you know we're really just proxying for these fundamental culture divides all right so help me actually break this down a bit, because I'm, I'm hearing three main things. One is racial resentment, another one is education, and another one is trust. Help me understand how all of these interact, how they correlate, 
where the correlations are strongest and how this informs a kind of identity of culture. Yeah. So I'll add the fourth one, which I think is, is re really interesting, which is openness to new experiences. So in psychometrics, when people study personality, they really like to break personality down into five different factors. Uh, I think it's openness, agreeableness, neuroticism, conscientiousness, and uh, missing one. But you know, they like to say that a lot of different personality actions that people can take are kind of a linear combination in a lot of ways of these five different factors. Mm -hmm. And historically, Openness to new experiences has been very highly correlated with education levels and, you know, generally with a lot of different cognitive tests and also has been associated with liberalism, while conscientiousness, which is, you know, basically how often you, you know, finish your tasks on time, how frequently you vote, you know, stuff like that tends to be correlated with being conservative. But I, and these correlations have always been there. But I think what's really notable is that these correlations have gotten a lot higher. And, you know, I think that that's something that's been kind of the driving force in a lot of ways behind education polarization, that if you look at Actually, when you when we give personality tests, you know something that we see is that these Obama to Trump voters are very very low in openness to new experiences, and so in terms of what that means, you know I think that there's a real difference. I don't want to say in people's brains, but in terms of how people experience, you know, novel stimuli, you know, where if you ask questions like, do you like spicy food, or you know, do you like you know avant garde art, like a lot of these things end up being very correlated with partisanship, and I think that. It also ends up being highly correlated with where people choose to move. Something that's super interesting is just that, you know, people who are high in openness tend to move to denser cities and more, you know, more racially diverse neighborhoods, while people who are lower in openness tend to, you know, move out to rural areas where things are quieter. And so I think that's one angle. And then I think, you know, there's another angle, <laughs> sorry to produce so many of these, which is, you know, this idea of zero sum conflict. You know, something that I think is really interesting is that there's been research showing that in general, people who are more educated are more open to the idea of positive sum change, while people from working class backgrounds tend to be really skeptical about positive sum change and see a lot of things as zero sum. And, you know, I, I think that's a result probably of life experiences like, you know, working class people actually most of the conflicts in their life really are zero sum. You know, if you work at a Walgreens, there's very little producer surplus. It's, you know, you, you versus the managers. While I think that college educated, you know, people live more blessed lives. But there's a lot of these different factors that I think it's really interesting that they're all correlated with each other. I can't say like this is the thing, but I think it they're all highly correlated and they're all telling the same story. And that I, I think that's a paints an interesting picture. All right. So a couple questions for you. One, I think you're referring to the big five personality traits. If I'm not mistaken, these traits have a large heritable component to them, and they're seen as being pretty constant over the course of your life. You know, if you're neurotic at the age of 20, you're going to be neurotic at the age of 50, more or less. But in the case of, of working class folks, for example, there is a strong narrative that has been put forward to explain why they perhaps have become less open to new experiences or they've become less agreeable, more disagreeable. To what extent does that, the fact that there is a, a kind of an external environmental explanation driving this, impact the viability of the assessment that these are biological traits? Two, a lot of these voters voted for Obama. So, you know, how do you explain that? And then three, do you see this happening in other parts of the world? Is there a similar kind of, are there similar characteristics, personality characteristics of voters who vote for more populist right wing candidates in Europe, for example? Yeah, I, I think all of these correlations, you see basically the same story in every European country. You know, with, there's a great paper that showed that openness to new experiences was, you know, more correlated than education in Britain. These occupational divides show up really clear as day. You know, in Sweden, for example, there's been a rapid shift in the last 10 years to the point where the Swedish Democrats, which is their far right party, are now the plurality party among union members when it used to be that, you know, the social Democrats, you know, were by far the, the leaders. And so th these transitions have happened, you know, basically everywhere. And I think, you know, the reason why this is happening is basically that being part of the the branding of the center left has really changed a lot, not just here, but in basically every country, you know, in the Western world, where it used to be that whether or not you were a Democrat was a function of 
you know, your attitude toward whether or not taxes should be raised. And so there were a lot of, you know, grumpy working class people who didn't want to eat Thai food or whatever, who still voted for Democrats. And that was true as recently as 2012. You know, Barack Obama won in 2012 because he did very well with working class white people in the Midwest, a lot of whom were lower in openness. And, you know, what's changed is that the salience of these cultural issues has changed. When we look at you know, 2016, the correlation between your views on immigration went up from 2012 to 2016, and the correlation between your views on taxes or your views on universal health care went down. And I think the reason why this is happening is basically because of these choices that center-left parties have been making. And this has been a long-term trend, you know, to be clear. There's this great graph that looks at, you know, the gap between college-educated voters and non-college-educated voters, you know, going back for something like 60 years in the U.S., in the U.K., and in France. And there's been a pretty clear linear trend. You know, 2016 was like, you know, Obama managed to kind of keep things at level and even depolarize things a little bit, probably partly because of the Great Recession. But if you take the long term view, you know, 2016 was just a return to this, you know, long term trend that's been happening and 2020 was an acceleration of that trend. And I think the reason why this is happening, big picture, is that education levels are a lot higher than they used to be. Like if you go back to the post war era, about 4% of the electorate had a college degree. And if you look at the latest election, something like 40% of the electorate has a college degree. And the most common educational category right after the post-war was less than high school. 80% of the population hadn't graduated from high school. And that number now is something like 8 or 9%. So the country is much, much more educated than it used to be. And education is highly correlated with openness to new experiences, with kind of a lot of these cosmopolitan values, with openness to immigration. And I think that the story that I like to tell is that highly educated people have always run both parties. That's just how the world works. Highly educated people tend to run most institutions. But in 1948, political elites knew that if they ran an election on cosmopolitan values, that they would definitely lose because most of the country doesn't agree with them, overwhelming majorities. And the one time they tried, you could argue, is you know, George McGovern in 1972. And what's funny is that the 1972 Mm. presidential election looks a lot like the 2016 election. You just subtract a lot, you know, because it was, you know, 40 years ahead of its time. And so- He lost, McGovern lost by like 39% or something in the popular vote, right? That's right. But it's very funny because if you look at the map, it looks a lot like a modern map where, you know, we get crushed in relative terms in West Virginia. We do really well in cities in relative terms. Like it it was a candidacy that was way ahead of its time. But you run a McGovern style campaign in 2016 and you get 51.1% of the vote. You lose the Electoral College, but, you know, that's a different issue. And so I think that, you know, what's happened is that now that it's possible to run on cosmopolitan issues, the left has like lost a lot of restraint. You know, they previously knew not to talk about these things because they would definitely lose. And now you're at a point where if you do talk about, you know, these cosmopolitan issues that people who run the party care about, you know, you might not be able to win the presidency. Maybe you can if there's a recession at your back, but you could definitely win a Democratic primary. You can win, you know, a New York mayoral election. And so there's been this you know, force of gravity, you know, kind of changing how the party talks about things, changing what candidates end up getting selected. And it's had a really big effect. And these gravitational pulls happen basically everywhere. You know, another way I like to talk about this is that politics is kind of fundamentally about splitting people in half. And when 4% of the population has a college degree, this cultural divide between college educated voters and non college educated voters isn't going to become politically salient. But if they're 40% of the electorate and there are these big cultural differences, then it's really hard to imagine, you know, how it doesn't, you know, sprout up and become this big political issue. Very interesting. So, what you're saying is that as a result of the fact that a larger percentage of the electorate now shares the cultural values of elites within the Democratic Party, that people within the party, party officials, activists, politicians, have overestimated their ability to win races by running on these cosmopolitan values. And so they've actually found themselves increasingly out of step with the majority of the country. Yeah, I'd say you know the way to think about it is that the Democratic Party is something like 20% ahead of the median voter. Democratic politicians are chasing the median donor, you know, the median primary voter, and these groups are 
themselves, you know, a lot more progressive on these issues than they were 40 years ago, but they're going ahead because of this pull. And, you know, that's causing a lot of problems. And, and there's one other thing I'd say, which is, you know, I think if we had a different electoral system, you know, it would probably be fine. But the problem we have, like, Building well, a co- before like, oh, oh, oh. before before I forget, I kind of do want to ask this point to clarify because what you're describing here sounds like a much more divided country than what we had 40 years ago. It isn't just that it's divided by a different factor; it's that the the divide is greater. And so, if that's in fact true, regardless of the electoral college and regardless of who can actually win an election, does governing become more difficult as a result of this? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think that if you look at the immediate post-war era, it was a really interesting difference where, you know, the elites were very different, you know, than the overall population. And, you know, this showed up in a lot of different ways. You know, school prayer was banned, you know, there were a lot of ways in which I think, you know, the government was more progressive than what what the people were doing, but there was like bipartisan agreement on a lot of these issues. While the, you know, voting public, you know, they were just kind of uniformly all culturally very conservative. If you flash forward to now, there is this really big cultural divide that didn't exist before. There were other divides that existed before. I mean, we don't have Jim Crow. We don't have the Vietnam War. So, Right. You know, Another natural they're... question that comes up is, has the racial divide lessened as some of these other divides have grown? But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a great point. But I think that this is a new divide. I don't want to I don't want to compare things too much. I think the real reason why the country has gotten, you know, harder to govern is just that things have gotten a lot more polarized. And that's true on an individual level. It's something I want to talk about later when it comes to structural biases. But you can operationalize this just in terms of the correlation between how people vote for Senate and how people vote for House. I mean, it used to be much lower, but even going back to 2012, there was a correlation of about 0.7. You know, at the same time that Obama lost North Dakota by like 10 points, Heidi Heitkamp won. And there were a bunch of red state Democrats that, you know, won in places like Indiana and Missouri. And that was 2012. If you go back to the 90s, you know, it was even lower. That correlation now is 0.95, I think 0.954 or something like that. And so there's a lot more ticket splitting. Increased uniformity across all the elections. Yeah, there's increased uniformity across all the elections. And if you look at what that means, I think there's two pieces to it. You know, one is the thing that's causing this is that voters are a lot more informed, I think, is the way to put it. You know, something I think is really interesting is that there are a lot of, there are now multiple studies looking at the rollout of 3G internet or the rollout of broadband, both here and in other countries that really connect this idea of people becoming more politically polarized, you know, there being lower rates of ticket splitting and higher rates of ideological extremism associated with there being greater access to information. And so there being greater access to information means that Republican primary voters and Democratic primary voters and also the electorate at all, they're all much more informed about the stakes of national politics. And so it used to be that, you know, you could have somebody like you know, Senator Church, I think Frank Church was his name, you know, he came from Idaho and he was one of the most liberal senators to ever exist in the Senate. If you actually look at, you know, uh, ideological scaling and he came from Idaho, which was a super conservative state. And the reason he was able to, it used to be that you could go into a place and be charming and, you know, talk about, do ribbon cutting ceremonies and all of this stuff and still win and be a liberal from a conservative state and vice versa. But now that people are better informed, you can't do that anymore. These races are much more polarized. And so I think that creates two different two different forces. One is that the primary voters are much more informed and more extreme, and so they're going to push to select more extreme candidates. But the other piece is that it makes the incentives to be moderate a lot lower than they used to be. I think that they're still there. The ideological gains to moderation, I think, are very real. But it, you know, it used to be that if you were in a state like Colorado, I think there's a real story that all of these different senators, uh, Republican senators, used to feel like if they didn't cooperate with the other side and have accomplishments to their name, that they would underperform and they wouldn't be reelected. And I think there was like a when there was more room for elections to move around, you know, voters do like cooperation. They do want compromise. They want concrete accomplishments. And so that created a real incentive for politicians to cooperate with each other. But now that everything is so determined by the presidency, I think that there's much more incentives for brinkmanship than there were before. So when I was growing up, the conventional wisdom was that you ran to the left or to the right of center, depending on your party, during the primaries, and then you came into the middle 
to win the general. But I think one of the things that we started to see maybe in the second Bush election, George W. Bush, was this phenomenon of actually dragging the center in your direction. It sounds like what you're saying, and I don't know if you agree with that, but it sounds like what you're saying is there's actually now we're back at a place where you know both of these parties have been sort of you know tug of warring it, trying to move the electorate in either one of their directions by being more and more extreme, and more and more of a, of a big chunk of moderate voters has had to choose between the lesser of two evils. And it sounds like what you're saying is that this has opened up a much larger percentage of moderate voters that are accessible to a party that would be perhaps more compromising. Is that roughly correct? I think that statement is correct. But I think it's interesting because there are fewer moderates than there have ever been just because of these trends of, you know, greater and access to information and other facts. Well, that's, you know, okay, people- you know what, before, sorry, I just, that's, uh, let's put a pin in this. Just, I want to talk about what you mean when you, when you say access to information, because I would say that there are no unbiased sources of information out there. It's more biased than ever. And people get their information from highly partisan sources that are heavily editorialized. So I, I wonder what you mean, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's a sense in which that's true, but I I think that the thing that's hard here is that, you know, I I think people want to tell this story of, you know, the internet made people worse and that, you know, racial resentment has gone up or that, you know, these far right attitudes have gone up. And I think that the story is actually quite different. I think that these people have always been bad, so to speak. You know, the actual trends of these things, people are more open to immigration now than they've ever been. Racial resentment is lower than it's ever been. People are, you know, pretty liberal by historical standards. You know, the problem isn't that, you know, the internet has poisoned people's minds and made people more conservative. The problem is that people used to be fairly badly informed about national politics. And so because of that, there were a bunch of highly conservative people in Idaho who wanted conservative policies to pass. And, you know, if you quiz them, really probably wanted there to be a unified conservative government, but they still voted for Frank church. And maybe they weren't aware of the way he voted, or maybe they weren't aware of the consequences. That's but now, interesting. And, you know, this showed up, you know, this is what I think is really interesting. It's not just that ideology change, it's that ticket splitting declined dramatically when broadband internet came in. And so, you know, I, I, I Wait, think but that- I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand here. So these people were becoming, they were trending increasingly conservative insofar as we can sort of identify a conservative characteristic, but they were right. still voting for Democrats. Right. This is the key point is, you know, people in Idaho have always been conservative. Republicans would win Idaho by large amounts. And it's not just Idaho. Like there were Democratic senators, even as recently as 10 years ago, in places like North Dakota and South Dakota and Montana, we actually controlled almost the entire plain state delegation. And I think that most of the people who voted, you know, for these Democrats, I think were conservatives. They ideologically is rational for them, I think, to vote for Republicans. And that's the thing that I find very scary about this trend is that I think that, you know, ticket splitting doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I think that it's unsurprising that like as a as a behavior, it's like really gone down as people have become more informed about national politics. The question though is how do we define conservative? So why would someone who is quote conservative vote for Frank Church unless there were issues that Frank Church was behind that they agreed with? Which brings us back to the question of definitions and what it means to be a conservative today versus 40 or 50 years ago and the relationship between values and politics. Yeah. You know, I think that- Like we had, sorry, just to say, we had like a lunch bucket Democrats, for example, or the Reagan Democrats. I mean, how do we define that? I think something that's hard in political science is that, you know, you can always go in every direction of these trends and these trends are true, where I think it's definitely true that what these candidates have run on has changed and what they've talked about has changed. You know, Democrats in the 1970s, you know, people in these red states were more liberal than they are now. You know, Idaho was never a blue state, but it's a much redder state than it was. And, you know, a lot of that decline has been among working class white people. You know, it used to be that we do really well in mining towns and, you know, nickel mining towns and whatever in Idaho. And, you know, now we don't. It's kind of the same story as West Virginia. And some of that is because we talk about issues, different issues than we used to. So I do think, you know, there has been this ideological polarization that's a function of what people have talked about. But I think a different piece of this is that there really used to be, like, I I think if you look at why were people voting for Frank Church, I think a lot of it was that 
he was like charming. He was delivering uh, money to his district. He talked about local issues. And I think that this could be a different way to get at what you're talking about, which is that, you know, politics has become less and less local. It used to be that you could as a senator, get a bunch of earmarks into your district, and then people, even if they disagree with you on abortion or taxes, will still vote for you because of you know what you deliver. And you know, local politics has gotten a lot a lot less local. I, I think some of this is an information environment where you know you can argue instead of people getting more informed, maybe they're learning more about national politics and they're learning less about local politics. There aren't you know local newspapers as much anymore. There's way fewer local journalists. But I think you know the issues that people have started to care about have become a lot more nationalized and things were a lot more incoherent earlier. I think yeah, I have a few thoughts on this that I'll try to share coherently before we move the second part of our conversation into the overtime, David. I think that to your point about information, the environment in which people get their information today has become inundated with highly charged, emotionally inflammatory rhetoric that oftentimes has very little to do with the core issues that have long resonated with a broad portion of the electorate. So even if people would be amenable to voting for an issues-driven candidate, the political media environment today makes that very difficult because, again, it rewards emotional responses that aren't particularly conducive to the type of intellectual discourse and epistemic analysis that you would need in order to run and win an issues-driven campaign, number one. Number two, to this other point about what it means to be a Democrat, what it means to be a conservative, and how do we define these identities, I've seen this change happen in my own life. As someone who has, for most of my life, identified culturally as a liberal, I found myself increasingly at odds with the Democratic Party and what I've felt have been its divisive, identity-driven narratives about the nature of the problems we face as a country and where and how we should focus our energies in order to fix these problems. Which also speaks to something else I want to discuss with you in the overtime, and that has to do with this counterintuitive increase in levels of support for Donald Trump that we saw in 2020 among black men and Hispanics, what that means, and how that squares with this larger democratic narrative that we've been discussing. Also, I want to ask you what you think the broader lessons are that we can take away from this election, and what the trends that we've been discussing here mean for the future of the Democratic and Republican parties and platforms. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of my conversation with David, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so that you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. David, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. Great. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.